Well, good morning. How are we all doing? Are you cool enough? Do we need to lower it so that we can enjoy it for a while? How about if I just preach a really long sermon and we can just stay here in this cool church all day, huh? Well, no, if somebody falls asleep and falls down dead, I don't know if we can resurrect them. That did happen. Um, this week has been a, an incredible week. We have had 75 plus kids down at Old Oak Ranch. Hello? <laughs> Think about that for a moment. 75 plus young people impacted by Jesus Christ. Amen. What God is going to do in those kids' is heart, we can't imagine. I believe God's going to speak to some of those kids. <clears throat> They're going to be ministers. They'll be pastors. They're going to serve the Lord all their life because never think that when a kid has an experience with Jesus, oh, that's just a little kid's thing. No. It's not. And when God touches a little kid and they know it's God, it never leaves them. It never leaves them. We've been studying the book of Acts. And Lana started with the second chapter talking about the day of Pentecost. And she shared her own experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and then she started going to a church and she saw weird things. And she made the comment, she says, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not weird. People, we sometimes are. <laughs> and sometimes we do weird things. But God the Spirit is not weird. The Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. If you see something and they say this is the Holy Spirit and it's not pointing to Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit draws people to Jesus. And Lana did a great job of expressing that. And Andy talked about how when Peter was filled with the Spirit and the change that came over his life. Can you imagine here Peter, always in trouble, always putting one foot in the mouth and taking it out and putting another one back in. <laughs> Never seemed to be able to get his thinking right. But when he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, it says, when they were saying, what's going on here? He stands up along with the rest of them and says, this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you've read the book of Joel? I, I often think to myself, was, was that a popular book in, in uh, Peter's day where, you know, I think I'm going to study the book of Joel today. No, the Holy Spirit brought to his memory what he had learned from the book of Joel and he preached that message and Andy said that that message is for every one of us the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for a select few the reason why the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened because in the Old Testament the Spirit came upon just a few a prophet here, a king here, to do something for the Lord, and then that spirit left them. But what God was saying in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on who? All flesh. Say that with me. All flesh. Turn to somebody and say, that's you and me. That's you and me. All flesh. And then Manny, so wonderfully explained that Peter was proving who Jesus Christ was because of his resurrection. And then he declared, this Jesus, I mean, really remember, timid Peter, who had already denied Jesus three times because he wasn't uh, bold enough to say, yeah, I, I belong to him. He says to them, this Jesus, whom you crucified, is now made Lord and Messiah. And their response was, what do we do? 
Well, let's look at our text. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse, well, let's start in verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's word pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles and all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation and those who believe that what Peter said and were baptized and added to the church that day, some 3,000 in all. Let's pray. Jesus, I did not take lightly the speaking of your word in truth. And Lord, I don't want these just to be words. I want your Holy Spirit to come and open our hearts to hear what you are wanting to speak to us. Lord, every one of us are going through things in our lives that <clears throat> you perhaps have been talking to us about, but we're not listening. Lord, we open our hearts to hear your word this morning. And Lord, I, I humble myself before you to say, Lord, speak through me. Speak through your servant, I pray. And let our hearts be glad in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Bob says, we pastored here for 30 years, and my wife will be celebrating 48 years of marriage this, in a couple of weeks. When I hear that, that says, that makes me feel old. <laughs> no, I should say that makes me sound old, but I, because I already feel old. Um, but what a joy it has been to, since we retired and still are part of this congregation, to see what God is doing. I was thinking about this the other day as I was driving and, and running through the passage that what is happening is that what was prophesied by the Joel that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men will dream dreams. I always dreamed that God had good things for this body of believers. Always. Even in the lean years, I kept believing, Lord, you gave me a dream. And I know you're going to fulfill it. And he's doing that. It's just incredible to see and watch what God is doing. You're a part of an old man's dream. Because some of us old men, that's not all we can do is dream. Because we can't run. But we can dream. So let's look at the text. First thing I want to point out is that they were pierced in their heart. Peter's words was not convincing to their mind, but their heart. The, the Greek word means to dig and probe deep into the heart. Until someone is truly touched in the heart, they're not going to respond. We can try to convince somebody. We can give all the texts. And we can give all the, the proof, but unless the Holy Spirit hits their heart, it's not going to change them. Sometimes we can try to guilt people into responding. That doesn't work. It's the Holy Spirit who comes and searches the heart. And he points itself to us. Psalms 51.17 says that the Lord is near to those who are of a broken and a contrite heart. If you want God, I hear people say, I just want to be near God. Well, 
Check your heart. Is it broken? Is it contrite? Is it open to what God is wanting to say and do? Because that's who he's near. Now the downside is what Jeremiah says, or Joel says in 2.13. We can have that up there. He says, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. So it's not just making a decision, okay, I think I'm going to do this. No, it's coming to grips with what God is speaking into your heart. Over the years, I've had an opportunity to, to work in camps when I was started out in ministry up in Canada as a youth pastor and worship director. And we had a camp on a lake. And one night, well, before that, that afternoon, <clears throat> somebody came to me and said, uh, there's some guys that are, have left camp. Well, I was a director, so I needed to go and find them. And so I take off out this road and go down, and there was a, a, a public place. There was a snack shack, and there was some picnic tables and right by the lake. And here was one of the guys, his name was Peter. And he was sitting there at the table, and he was smoking. And I went up to him and said, hey, Peter, what's going on? He said, well, I'm just kind of chilling. Have you heard that? Just chilling. How can you be chilling when you're smoking? What's chilling? I didn't say anything. I said, uh, we need to go back to camp. So we went back to camp. That evening, the speaker spoke, and he talked about we have to make a choice. Either we're going to serve Jesus or we're not. And so tonight, you guys get to have a choice. And the auditorium was this way, and then off this side was the cafeteria. He says, all those who want to serve Jesus and want to follow Jesus the rest of your life, I want you to stand and go over in that room. And three-quarters of the laughter went over there. And he says, and those that don't, you're free to leave. He didn't push it. He didn't beg. He didn't plead. He didn't convict. He didn't point the finger. He says, that's your choice. Go ahead and have some fun. Went over to this room, and there was Peter sitting at a table. He had his head down, and he was weeping. Peter didn't weep. He was the big brother of seven kids, and he was strong. He was tough, but he was weeping. And I went over, and I put my arm around him. I said, Peter, what's going on? And he took this pack of cigarettes out, and he moved them over, and he says, I don't want these. I want Jesus. I prayed for him. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I wished him a happy birthday. His last birthday on Facebook. He had his own business. God has blessed him. He's still very active and involved in the church and in other ministries. And his company uh, gives a lot of uh, money to services. Not because somebody forced him to, but because his heart was changed. God wants to change our hearts. We had a neighbor years ago. We just moved into the neighborhood, and somebody went and told her that, hey, a pastor's moving in next door. That's the last thing she wanted to hear. And... Uh, so she kind of stayed at a distance, but, you know, my kids were young, and they, we had a, a wild beagle that wouldn't listen to anybody but Bobby. She, once her scent got outside the front door, she took off, and I'd have to go over and knock on Bobby's door. Bobby, Penny's out again. Can you call her? And she would come out with a sweet voice, Penny, Penny, and Penny would come running to her. And I'd stand there with the leash behind my back, and as soon as she would come, and i grab her and take her back. But she didn't really want much to do with us. Until one night I was coming home from a council meeting. 
And as I pulled in, she comes out and she says, Fred, I need some help. I go, what's wrong? She goes, I did a stupid thing. I put some artichokes in the garbage disposal. And it's all clogged up and I can't fix it. I don't know what to do. So Mr. Handyman Fred, <laughs> and you that are laughing is because you know that I'm not a Mr. Handyman. I said, sure, I'll be right over. And I'm walking into the garage and I'm going, what were you thinking? <laughs> and I said, well, Lord, this is, must be of you. And so I went over there and I actually was able to fix it. And she had running water and she was just so grateful. The next morning I'm getting in my car and getting ready to go and she goes, uh, Fred, I, my toilet's running. I go, I'll be right over. So I went over and fixed it. Well, then she gets a phone call from her son. And she, her son called her and says, Mom, I want to tell you something. I have AIDS. He was living in Florida. And she says, well, I don't know what to do. And she says, he says, Mom, you need to go to church. She goes, well, I don't know where to go to church. I've never been to church since we moved to Chico. He says, well, why don't you go to Fred's church? At least he looks like he's normal. <laughs> so she came. She used to sit second, third row with my wife. And all through the worship service, She'd just weep and just weep and just weep. And she came to me and she goes, I, I don't know what's wrong. I'm, I just always weep. I says, Bobby, the Lord just loves you so much. He's just pouring his love all over you. And you're experiencing everything that God wants. And, and you're just responding with the tears of your heart. See, God's after our heart. And when they asked Peter, what shall we do? Because their hearts were pierced. He gives them the answer. He says, repent. You know, there's two words in Scripture that <clears throat> we tend to think is negative words. This one, repent, because we've seen those people, or we've seen signs of people standing and pointing and says, repent, repent, repent. I can remember in high school, I used to take a group of kids from our church through the Rose Parade. We'd leave at 2 o'clock in the morning and go down and sleep in the gutter on Colorado Boulevard waiting for the Rose Parade. Anybody done that? You've done that? Anybody else? Boy, we're more like each other than we think, Glenn. It was kind of scary, but we, we did it, and I don't know why my parents allowed me to do that, and I don't know why parents allow their kids to go with me. But we took about 25, 30 kids and we would sleep there in the gutter because it was cold. And I can remember wrapped up in my sleeping bag and this car coming by and he had all these signs all over his car. Repent, 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 turn or burn. In fact, that's what I was going to call my message and then I thought, no, I better not call it that way. <laughs> and then the car stopped right in front of where I was and the guy pointed his finger and he says, repent. I already did. <laughs> he was making a judgment. That's not the Lord. The Lord doesn't come and point his finger at us. I don't think Peter was standing up and pointing his finger and saying, repent. He says, you want to know how to change? The same way the prophets of old told you, repent. The same message that Jesus had was repent. The other word that we have a negative connotation to is obey. How many think that's a good word? Three. How many think it's a bad word? How many is afraid to vote? <laughs> because obey is simply doing it God's way. It's simple. What's the old hymn? Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey. Somebody came up to me after the first service and said, you know, 
that song stuck with me because obedience and trust go together. When I trust God, I can obey him because I know that in obeying him, he's got my back. I mean, go through the Old Testament and look at the people who were blessed and blessed and blessed because they did what? They obeyed. Abraham, he obeyed and went. Read the book of Hebrew chapter 11, the faith chapter, and it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Noah obeyed. By faith, they obeyed. That word faith is trust. It's trust in God. And repent is turning to God. It's changing the way we were going. When John the Baptist and Jesus came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was saying there needs to be a shaking up of the way you're thinking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not some physical kingdom that's going to be coming and be established. It says the kingdom of God is already here because I'm here. In fact, he says the kingdom of God is within you. So they had to change their way of thinking. And those who put Christ on the cross, who were yelling out crucified, because they didn't understand. And they were unwilling to repent. But when you go back and you look at those who repented and turned to God, their lives became blessed. Let's look at this word a little more. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 3, Jeremiah says, O Lord, do not your eyes look for truth? You struck them, but they felt no pain. You crushed them, but they refused correction. They made their faces harder than stone and refused to repent. Now, Jeremiah is talking about the people of God. You go back and you look at the history of Israel and, and all the things that were going on because they refused to follow the things of God. And then they were wondering why they were always into captivity. They were always getting in trouble. Have you ever thought that? You know, there's a saying that says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. Well, until we repent and change... We're going to keep doing the same old thing and the same old thing, and we're not going to get any other results. But once we turn and start to choose to follow God, things change. Things change. Jeremiah 8, 6 says, I have listened attentively, but they do not say what is right. No one repents of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Each pursues his own course like a horse charging into battle. Ezekiel 14.6 says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, Repent, turn from your idols, and renounce all your detestable practices. See, God, he gave Israel an opportunity to repent, to change their way, to turn. And even on the day of Pentecost, because a lot of those people that were there on the day of Pentecost were some of the same people that were there when they said, crucify him, crucify him. And can you imagine Peter just saying, this Jesus whom you crucified now has been made Lord and Messiah. That was pretty bold, pretty strong words. He wanted them to repent. Ezekiel. Chapter 18, 30 through 32. Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from your offenses. Then his sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Say that with me. Repent and live. 
That doesn't mean repent and breathe. It's that same thing that Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and live it what? Abundantly. Abundantly. And then he says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. When I was nine years of age, it was on a Friday night. And the reason why I want to use this story because we've had kids go up to camp and they may have a story that's similar. Jeff said it the other day that we, a little child shall lead them. And unless we have faith as a child, we can't come to God. The thing about children is they are not immersed in the thinking of the intellect. They hear about a Jesus who loves them, and that's not hard for them to grasp. <clears throat> and they want to do things the way Jesus wants them to do. And we had a lady evangelist that came to our church in Fresno, California. And she preached on heaven and hell. I told somebody, it says it's supposed to be 110 degrees on Sunday when I'm preaching. I think maybe I'll preach on hell. <laughs> but, uh, but she did not present hell as you're going to go there, you're going to go there mean. She talked more about Jesus and heaven. And my little heart at nine years of age could only think of, I want to be with Jesus. I want to spend eternity with Jesus. At nine years old, I didn't even know what eternity meant. I know somebody says it's a long time, but for a kid, 10 minutes is a long time. I have a granddaughter that when we get ready to drive somewhere, she goes, how much further, Grandpa? I says, five minutes shorter than it was last time. Five minutes later, how much longer, Grandpa? Five minutes less than last time. We don't understand all of that, but I knew one thing. I wanted Jesus in my life. And I came forward and I went up and she knew me. She knew the family and she says, Freddie, how can I help you? Jesus to come into my heart. She said, okay then. And she led me into a prayer. And then she put my, her head on my hands. I was kneeling down. And she says, Jesus, baptize little Freddie. That's me because I was little. <laughs> Not much has changed. <laughs> well, uh, there has been a change. He says, Jesus, baptize little Freddie in the Holy Spirit. And for the next hour, I laid on my back and prayed in a language I'd never heard. I didn't know if anybody was around me. I didn't care what they were saying. I wasn't loud. I was just doing it with Jesus. And I was so in love with Jesus. And I knew from that moment on that he would never leave me. And that he empowered me to be everything I needed to be for him. Two weeks later, I was baptized in water to confirm everything that says, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus. Those that got baptized last week, they made a declaration, I'm going to follow Jesus. There comes a time in our life where we have to say, I'm going to make a point. I got to change. And that's the message that Peter was trying to communicate. He says, repent and now be baptized. There's an action to that. There's something that needs to solidify that says, I want to identify with who Jesus is. Then he says, when you do that, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I know that there are some that teach that that's no longer for today. Well, according to what it says here, it says, in, this promise is for you. This promise is for your children. 
This promise is all who are afar off and all who the Lord our God shall call. Promise is for every one of us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit begins when our heart is pierced by the Holy Spirit. And we recognize, Lord, I need to repent. I need to change. And Lord, I need to receive everything that you have for me. If you went to somebody's house, I had a grandma that uh, if somebody would be in their house and she goes, somebody would come in and they go, wow, that's really a nice painting. I really like that. On their way home, they go to get out of the car and they realize that that painting is in the back of their car. You said something to grandma, she'd give it to you. She used to say that if we wrote her a letter, not email, they didn't have emails back in those days. Every time she, we could write a letter, we'd get a dollar. Oh, I wish I would have taken her up on that more. <laughs> but one day I wrote her because I wanted a catcher's glove because my brother was going to be pitching on his little league team and I wanted to practice with him. And so I said to Grandma, I says, I, I've collected enough money, but I still need $5. And I get a letter and inside the letter is a $5 bill. My dad says, what did you ask Grandma for? Uh, I just said I needed some money to get a glove, and this is what she sent me. Now, I could have taken that and go, well, maybe I shouldn't use it. Maybe I should just not do anything with it. I think sometimes that's where we are with gifts of God. And nah, that's not for me. Maybe you've had some negative experiences, and you go, ah, that's not for me. Do you know where that saying came, the throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Down in the south in the plantations, on Saturday it was bath time. And they would fill the bath with buckets of water, get it all in there. And the gentlemen took baths first because they were the dirtiest. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? And then they would throw out a little bit of the dirt water and then pour some more water in, and then the kids would get in, and then finally the baby. But if you go in there and you start to throw out the dirty water, make sure you don't throw out the baby. There's a lot of weird things that go on, but don't throw out the good just because there's some bad stuff out there. Open your heart to what the Holy Spirit has for you. And you'll be surprised how he begins to minister in you and through you and to you. And how he's going to allow you to do the same thing to those around you. Because that's who he is. That's what he does. He delights in being able to do that. And then he says, and with many other words, he warned them. Otherwise, he beseeched them, he invoked them, he prodded them, he pleaded with them. Because see, he knew what was in their hearts, because they were from the whole region, Jews from all around, and he knew where their history was, and he knew the hesitancy of repenting. And so Peter is pleading with them and begging them, oh, don't you see what God has for this is why Jesus came. This is why he died. And if you repent and be baptized, you too will experience what God has. And he's still doing the same thing today. Still doing it the same thing today. I want to ask the worship team if they'll come on up. I want the rest of us to stand.
want you to close your eyes and just think of your own heart today. Do you have a heart that's broken and contrite before the Lord? That's open to all that he has for us? Or is it a heart of stone that so often happens because of circumstances of life? But I'll tell you, there's somebody who loves you and who desires to do great, mighty things in your heart and life. If you allow your heart to be open before the Lord and say, Jesus, I want everything you have for me. Maybe some of you, there's some things that you're involved in that you know is not what God wants you to be doing. Just take a moment right where you're standing and say, Lord, I repent of that. I'm going to choose to follow you. I don't want those things in my life anymore. My heart is to follow you, God. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, maybe you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. I would just invite you to lift your hand and I'd like to see it and pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I just want to see what God has for you. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Lord, you know the heart of this person. And I pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, she would just know and understand that you love her. And that she wants to be a daughter of you. And she wants to serve you and follow you. So, Lord, I, I pray that you are just open up her heart in the name of Jesus. And I pray that as we end this service in worship and praise, that you will just celebrate the Lord and what he wants to do in and through you. And if you need prayer, you can come down. There'll be some people here to, to pray with you and to talk with you. But don't leave without making some kind of choice to say, Less, Lord, I, I, I just want to do that. I'm hearing what your spirit says, and Lord, I say yes. I say yes. In Jesus' name.
let's just sing this next part out together. Give your soul a pep talk this morning. If you need to respond to the Lord, do that. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Because you got a lion inside of the lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on. this morning, God. God, we give you all that we have. God, because God, you are the one who saves us. God, you are the one that set out a plan from the beginning of time to redeem us from this fallen world, God. And so, God, we thank you that you sent your son for us, God. And we give you all of our gratitude for all the things that you continue to do in our lives, God. And I pray that we would just respond to you, God, now and throughout the week. God, that we would be sensitive to your spirit and where you're leading us, God. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. Amen. 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 Well, if you do want prayer, if you want to talk through some of those responses, um, feel free to come forward for prayer. But otherwise, have a great day, and we'll see you next week.